Anna sat in the front row at the funeral, trying to go through the ceremony without making a scene, but she couldn't shake the feeling that something was desperately out of place. When she couldn't stand it anymore, she rushed forward and flung the lid of the casket open. What happened next was shocking. While she sobbed in front of her son's coffin, Anna couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously out of place. She had racked her head trying to find answers since the moment she had identified his body in the morgue, but hadn't been able to get a single one. And two days later at the funeral, that feeling had grown to a nagging certainty. Anna shifted in her chair, trying to still her legs. If she could, she would get up and snatch her beloved Michael from the coffin he had been hastily placed in that morning. They hadn't even waited for her to say the last goodbye before putting the lid on, and had told her that opening it back would be disrespectful for the deceased. But the deceased was her son, and as his mother, she should have been able to look at him one last time. Her brother put a stilling hand on her shoulder. He was a doctor in San Jose, and had flown in to be with her during the funeral. According to him, things like this happened all the time, but she just couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. In the chapel, Anna sat with her eyes fixed on the casket. It was a laser-like focus, joined to the sense that something was wrong. Then a voice spoke audibly in her mind. Michael's not dead, it said. You have to check. For a moment, Anna was startled. She had heard the voice, but also knew it came from inside her. Before the minister had completed his sermon, the feeling became untenable. She had to know. She needed to take one last look at her son, who had been in the prime of his life, and make sure that he was truly gone. But what would she do when she confirmed that he would never come back to her? She couldn't bring him back. She would never see his smile again, a smile that had been forever present on his face, at least until everything had gone south. For a long time, Michael Doherty had been the picture of happiness. Over the past five years, he had established his own accounting practice. His deal-making prowess and youthful vigor made him a favorite in business circles, and he rubbed shoulders with the highest echelons of Sarasota society. Just when he thought life couldn't get any better, he met Natalie. They met at a bar and started talking, and by the third drink, it was as if they had known each other all their lives. Michael and Natalie liked the same things. They shared the same interests, lived in the same neighborhood, and were both in business. As it turned out, Natalie was a corporate lawyer for her father's business, one of the biggest in Florida. Their relationship quickly caught fire, and by the third week, they were inseparable. After two months, Michael put his condo on the market and moved into her home in the upper neighborhood of Harbor Acres. Michael's business continued to flourish, but Natalie started to subtly put pressure on him to join her father's firm. They needed someone with his talents and abilities, she told him over and over. In the firm, he'd have access to more capital and he'd be able to put together projects with a higher price tag. She promised he'd be left to do his own thing and eventually put on an official offer on the table that took Michael's breath away. It took him almost a month to decide to accept the offer. Initially, he balked at the thought of giving up his freedom to work in a big corporation. Then he did the math. It would take him another 10 years of his own before he would start making the kind of money they were offering him. When Michael realized that working for Natalie's father's company would make him a multimillionaire within a few short years, he told her to get the contract ready. The first few months were terrific, to say the least. Michael took the bigger deals like a fish to water. Promises were kept, and he was able to operate on his own most of the time. The projects he designed were ingenious, and his financial structures impressed Natalie's father and all the investors he did business with. Above all, he got to work with Natalie, and he loved it. Then something shifted. Michael started hearing rumors about her father from trusted sources. According to the grapevine, his business ethics left much to be desired. He was ruthless, operated without a conscience, and slithered through legal and tax loopholes as a matter of course. All of this went directly against Michael's grain. While he had carefully guarded his reputation for honesty and ensuring that all his deals were always above board, Natalie's dad apparently did exactly the opposite. For the next two months, Michael secretly worked inside the company to make sure the information he had received was accurate. At night, after everyone had left the office, he scoured the old man's deals, went through piles of files, and analyzed the accounting Natalie's father had used to bring the deals to fruition. The deeper he dug, the stronger the sinking feeling he developed. The source was right. Not one single deal was clean. The taxman had been bamboozled, a separate set of statements had been prepared for investors on various projects, and Natalie's father had been pocketing millions of dollars 
and illegitimate gains. It took Michael a while to confront Natalie with what he had found. He was between a rock and a hard place. He loved her, and he knew she loved her father. He would essentially be giving her a choice between him and the old man. But he finally decided that he couldn't compromise his integrity. Over dinner at home, Michael told Natalie everything. And as he'd expected, she exploded. First, she accused him of spying on the company, something he fervently denied. The more he tried to explain that he was doing the right thing, that he was trying to verify serious accusations instead of blindingly believing them, the less she wanted to hear. At some point in the conversation, the unthinkable happened. Michael started suspecting that Natalie was in on her father's dubious practices. She had to know. She had prepared all the contracts and had been her dad's inside man on all the deals. There was no way she was in the dark about all of this. But before he could voice his doubts, she kicked him out of the house. Confused, hurt, and suddenly without a future, Michael booked into a hotel. He was awake the whole night, thinking about his next step. The way Natalie had reacted, he was sure she would have phoned her father immediately and told him about the conversation. That meant his days within the company were numbered. But there was more. As Michael tried to plot a route forward, he thought about the old man's power and his money. Natalie's dad was rich and influential enough to ensure he never did business in Sarasota again. At a stretch, he could probably end his ability to do business anywhere in the United States. It could mean the end of his career altogether. And what was he to do then? Sell ice cream on the beaches of Florida? He didn't know. The following day, Michael was locked out of his office. He was escorted off the company premises by two bulky security guards and told in no uncertain terms never to return. For a few hours, he wandered through the streets with no destination in mind. He had nowhere to call home now. As the weeks passed, Michael became depressed. He found it almost impossible to get out of bed in the morning. He hardly slept and his stomach was in such a tight knot that he couldn't hold food down. Natalie being gone broke his heart. He cried, became angry at everything and everybody, and then cried some more. Eventually, Michael stopped showering. He wore the same dirty clothes day in and day out, sometimes even sleeping in them. He didn't answer his phone anymore and lived in his hotel room like a recluse. Then there was a knock on his door. It was his mother. Anna had known something was amiss with her son. He tried to disguise the despair in his voice each time he spoke to her, but like any mother, she could hear he wasn't right. She had driven through the night to get to Sarasota, phoned Natalie to find out where he was, and made her way to his room. When he opened the door, Michael burst into tears. Anna took him in her arms and held him while he sobbed. When his shoulders stopped jerking, she sat him down and told her everything. Most of it was too complicated for her to understand. But Anna caught the bigger picture. She knew her son was worried about his future and that the breakup with Natalie was eating away at him. With so much going on, he wasn't able to find ground and start the healing process. At first, she asked him to come home with her, to take his own bedroom, stay a while, and allow her to take care of him until he felt better. But Michael's pride wouldn't let him, and he rebuked all her offers. He needed to do this alone. Eventually, when Anna left, she hugged him tightly and started planning in her head to move to Sarasota to be nearer to him, even if it was for a while. Then came the phone call that changed everything. It was from the one person that had the power to bring light back into his life, Natalie. She told him that their separation had been going on too long and that she wanted to patch things up. No mention of her father or an apology, but he hadn't expected that. Red lights flashed. But Michael's desire to have Natalie back in his life overrode everything. Talking to her face to face was the first step. Hello, Mike, she said as she sat down at the bar where they had first met. The conversation was a little stiff to start, but then it thawed, and suddenly they found themselves in conversation like they'd never been apart. All the while, Michael's heart soared. It was all he wanted from life now, Natalie by his side, and all the unpleasantness in the past. By the time Michael reached his hotel room, life felt different. The darkness he had worn as a second skin for so long was dissolving like mist in the morning sun. Red lights were still flashing in his mind, but he ignored them completely. He could get Natalie back, and that was all that mattered. With her by his side, he would be indestructible again. One week later, Michael and Natalie were walking down Main Street in the heart of Sarasota. They'd gone out for ice cream 
and the world was Michael's oyster again. They were holding hands, and he felt that a reunion was imminent. It was just a matter of time now, and he was prepared to be patient. They were about to cross the road when Michael started feeling dizzy. Initially, he thought it was just the heat, but two steps into the crosswalk, the world started spinning. He lost his balance and collapsed. There was a weird sense of electricity running all through his body, and then Michael lost consciousness. Natalie dialed 911 and waited for the ambulance. The paramedics worked on Michael for 30 minutes, loaded him into the back of the ambulance, and then pulled Natalie aside. As gently as they could, they told her not to get her hopes up. Michael's heart had stopped, and they were going to keep up the CPR until they got to the hospital, but they felt he was probably not going to make it. Anna was about to settle down for her afternoon nap when Natalie phoned. She was businesslike. Michael had collapsed in town. His heart had stopped. He was declared dead upon arrival at the hospital, she said. She mumbled condolences and disconnected the phone. Anna was stunned. All the blood drained from her face. Something wasn't right. Michael was well again. He'd been eating, gone back to his fitness regime, slept well, and was designing his business again. He was healthy. Anna knew this because a mother knows these things. There was no reason why he would collapse in the middle of the day, at the age of 33. The rest of the day passed like a dream. She identified the body at the morgue and tried to sidestep the condolences from the medical staff. She returned home and phoned an undertaker. She told him what she wanted for the funeral and left the arrangements in his hands. Then Anna sat down and cried for the first time. She was still crying when she pulled her brother's hand off of her shoulder, staggered upright in the pew and made her way to the coffin. Complete silence fell in the chapel. All eyes were now fixed on her. Behind her, she could sense her brother standing up and hurrying over to her. But Anna reached the casket first. She gripped the lid of the coffin in both hands, put her back into it, and heaved. It swung open. Anna dropped her head onto Michael's chest, sobbing loudly. No one dared to speak as this devastated mother clutched her dead son's body. They understood her pain and were willing to let her cry and scream as long as she needed without making a sound. But that silence was the reason why she heard it. A single heartbeat. It was faint, and it was followed by a second. But she knew she had heard it. Anna felt elation well up within her. She flung her arms around Michael's neck and kissed him on the forehead. When she pulled back, she saw an eyelid move, like with the heartbeat. It was unnoticeable, but she knew what she saw. When her brother reached her, she took him by both shoulders, looked into his eyes and said urgently, Right now you have to believe me if it's the last thing you do. Michael's not dead. I heard a faint heartbeat and I saw his left eyelid move. We have to check again before we go on with the cremation. We have to get Michael to a hospital and I want you to do the examination. Her brother's face was the picture of sorrow. It was clear that he thought the pain was driving her crazy. He tried to reason with her reminding her that a doctor had checked the vitals and signed the death certificate, but she was immovable. Then the priest stepped up. He was well versed in grief and coping mechanisms, and told him that one last check might give Anna the peace she needed to start healing. The doctor sighed, then kneeled next to the coffin. He put two fingers on Michael's cold neck and listened for a heartbeat. And then he paled. He's alive, he shouted, immediately starting CPR. Call an ambulance! The mourners started gasping and screaming, and Anna was suddenly sobbing again, but for a completely different reason. Her beloved son had come back to her after all. The last thing she noticed when she left the chapel with the paramedics was Natalie's face, as white as a sheet. Six weeks later, Michael was well enough to go home. It had been an astonishing ordeal. He'd been poisoned with pufferfish extract. Only, it hadn't killed him. It only slowed his metabolism and respiratory system enough to make him appear dead. If it hadn't been for Anna's persistence and his uncle's medical expertise, he would have perished in the cremation fire. While he was in the hospital fighting for his life, Natalie, her father, and the medical doctor who had pronounced him dead were arrested. The doctor had been the first to confess. Natalie's dad had offered to put his son through college free of debt in exchange for a death certificate without an autopsy. Once the physician had come clean, the rest of the dominoes started tumbling. Natalie was next. When she realized she might spend the rest of her life in jail, she copped a plea. 
Her dad had been worried that Michael would go public with the information about his rotten deals, and he'd hatched a plan to get rid of him, permanently. Natalie had lured him out of his seclusion, and Michael's ice cream had been poisoned. For her trouble, Natalie received a sentence of 13 years. The doctor lost his license to practice and was sentenced to 9 years, and Natalie's dad would spend the rest of his natural life in prison. As for Michael, he was now the CEO of Natalie's father's firm. He could finally do clean business with unlimited funds, and he would use this opportunity to do good in the world. Anna moved to Sarasota right after the fake funeral, and Michael bought her an apartment next to his. She had been on the verge of losing her son once too many times, and she would never let him out of his sight again. What a shocking ending. Have you ever found information so damaging to someone that it made you fear for your own life? Tell us in the comments. We'd love to hear your story. For now, we're out of here. Catch you in the next video.